Shalom and greetings friends and fellow believers and even if you're not a believer this message today is is very important for all of us whether you're Jewish Orthodox or secular Gentile Christian even if you're an atheist it's important to hear what the scriptures have to say because as they become un, as they become fulfilled it is another proof that this is the word, the inspired word of our Creator. And I'm speaking to you during the annual Feast of Dedication, or as it's more commonly known today as Hanukkah. Now, it's not a commanded festival. We don't find it in the Tanakh at all, or in the what most Christians call the Old Testament. In fact, the only place in, in Holy Scripture that it's found is in the writings of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, the, the scriptures that the Christians prioritize is way higher than, than the Old Covenant or the, the Tanakh scriptures as it's referred to as. And if we turn to John chapter 10 in verse 22, notice our Messiah here, Yeshua, and uh, the Greeks later changed his name to Jesus, but Yeshua in Hebrew, that was his Hebrew name, and that's what everybody called him in the first century, and there's different ways to pronounce it based on the dialect, but it simply means that the Creator, yud heh vav -Hey, or Adonai if you prefer that, the Creator is salvation. And it's the same exact name that... Uh, Yahshua in the Battle of Jericho when he led the Israelites to Jericho and and they didn't do the fighting actually but the Creator did the fighting for them as as he prefers to in such type battles and, and difficulties he loves to fight our battles for us especially as we rely on him but notice if we turn to the book of John in 10 verse 22 it says now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, and it was winter, so the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, that's our Hebrew way of, of saying that word, and the Messiah walked in the temple in Solomon's court. And so here he was in the temple, and again, this isn't a commanded feast, but he was keeping it. It was more like a a feast of Thanksgiving. In the United States of America we have uh, a Thanksgiving weekend. We have in November, in the, in the month of November according to the Gregorian calendar. And we, the founders of this country, wanted to give dedication, a thankfulness to our one true creator who gave us this land, <clears throat> who brought us away from the tyranny as of Europe, the persecutions and and uh, the corrupt governments and the intent was to, to set up a democratic, uh, uh, a better government, although it's not perfect. And so we have the freedom of religion today without persecution. And we have a very mighty nation that the Creator has blessed for these purposes. And so we have Thanksgiving. It's not commanded. We shouldn't judge people or make it a commandment of division or contention, but simply a feast of dedication of Thanksgiving. And so we who are Hebrews, we thank our Creator, and even Christians out there, you should thank the Creator. Because where would our Messiah be when he was 12 years old? And he went to Jerusalem with his family to keep the feast. And remember, he stayed back for three days this is in, in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 2, verses 41 through 43. And remember, he told his parents, I'm about doing my father's business. He had the temple, that temple to go to, to the one true creator. And uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And this is who uh, the temple was dedicated to, and, and the whole purpose was, was David, uh, David, and his son Solomon was allowed to build that temple. It was destroyed. There was a second one that was restored, and so that was still alive during the first century. Uh, the temple was still up and going, but the Maccabees had to restore it in, 
in the early uh, BCE centuries here in, it's called the Roman Jewish Tre Treaty of 6, or 161 BCE. But before that, there are uh, some happenings that took place, and it's very parallel, and that's the purpose of this message, what I want to magnify and expound upon to you today, is that what happened with the Maccabees, what happened to the temple in that time is there's some parallels that are going to happen in the end time, in the end of this age. And we'll read about that. And it's it's throughout the, the Brit Hadashah in Hebrew, but it's New Covenant Scriptures. The writings of the apostles, the disciples, the faithful ones of, of the Messiah, Yeshua of the first century, and who believe that he's coming back to restore the temple. He fulfilled the first coming of the suffering servant and crucifixion, the Lamb of the Creator, and he is our mediator, our high priest, the Melchizedek high priest, not a Levitical, because he is from the tribe of Judah and a descendant from uh, David, King David, and as prophesied. But this Feast of Dedication, I want you to notice some parallels, and that's what I want to expound upon. And some people feel that some of these prophecies were already fulfilled, that there's no parallels for the end time, but I've got some evidence for you to consider here. Now, the Maccabees, what happened was, is you can read the story in more detail, you can search it, I don't want to cover too much of the details, but the temple was corrupted. It was taken over by the Seleucid Emperor uh, Antiochus Epiphany. He was uh, Antiochus Epiphany. Uh, the the fourth, and he reigned, and he he conquered Jerusalem. He he set up a a statue of himself and stopped the daily sacrifice. It was a abomination of desolation, is what he did in 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 that time period of about uh, six one hundred and sixty one hundred seventy one hundred seventy B C E. And so the Maccabees, from 167 to 164 B.C., led, led a, a revolt. They had to flee into the mountains for over three years. Now, Antiochus Epiphany, his name means, in Greek, it means God manifest, which means that he claimed to be God manifested into the flesh as a human being, that he was God, and he wanted to be worshipped as God, as the creator, as the ruler of the universe. <clears throat> and some of you who know the New Testament scriptures, the Brit Hadashah, can already see some parallels. But uh, before I get to that, you know, they, these Maccabees were in the mountains for three over three years, leading a revolt and a restoration of the Torah. And remember, the Apostle Shaul, where we say, many say Paul today, he says in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, he says, what advantage do the Jews have? He says, much advantage the Jews have. And he mentions how they have the oracles, the holy writings of the Creator. And so that's an advantage. And, and in Galatians, he early he says, And the gospel is to be preached to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. Because the Jewish people knew the Torah. They knew the holy language. And the, and the gospel is to be preached from the Torah. Not to do away, or nullify it, or nail it to the cross as, as a, a false... Uh, religion has been teaching for almost 2,000 years, uh, for hundreds of years at least, uh, that this view that the Torah, that the Jews, that we need to stop being Jewish if you're Gentile, we are to be grafted into Israel. Paul says in Romans 2 that we are to be Jews inwardly, and it's not just about a physical circumcision, but spiritual circumcision. And to be grafted into Israel. It's not a replacement theology, so beware of replacement theologies. Our Creator is restoring Israel, physically and spiritually. And so, 
it, what happened with the Maccabees, our Creator is going to see it happen again with spiritual Hebrews, physical and spiritual Hebrews in the end times. And so it's important to understand these scriptures. And before I do, I want to make it clear that we as believers of the New Covenant that was prophesied back in Jeremiah 31, 31, and so we see this New Covenant scriptures even given that we are to be preaching the truth regardless of, of what happens. And we also see in... Uh, that was my daughter that uh, ran out here while we're recording this message. But we see here, we have... Uh, we're not to be fighting physically. Uh, the Apostle Shaul said we, our weapons are not of this warfare. That our weapons are spiritual. We have a spiritual armor to put on as we read about in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20. And that our enemies are spiritual spirits, evil spirits in high places. And, and so we read about that in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5. Our Messiah, he tells us in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45, to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to, to pray for those, even those who are wanting to kill us. And he, on, on his crucifixion, was, was praying and saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And in the book of Acts, Chapter 7, verse 60, when Stephen was being martyred, he said the same thing. Please, Father, don't charge them for this sin. And so when people are blind, they are deceived. They think that they're serving their Creator, but they don't know better. We need to love them, not try to fight and defend ourselves. True believers now are to be a light and to be a, a light not of physical fighting and murder and killing. Our Creator, vengeance is His. He will take care. He will bless and do whatever blessings He wants to do and protection and healing and correction. And He always provides a way of escape. If you know Him and you are close to Him and you are not lukewarm and just wavering and just not really understanding how we are to live, we'll seek Him through the Word. If you have a growth process, a growth relationship with Him, He will get more in intimately involved with you as well. But uh, let's go back to this, some of these parallels that happened when this revolt started in, in 167 uh, BCE. The abomination of desolation was set up. And the Maccabees had to defend themselves against all odds. Of course, this was before the coming of the Messiah. And they, as the ancient Israelites, were, were defenders and fighters, physically. And, but let's go to uh, the book of Daniel, because Daniel talks about an abomination of desolation. Was this it? Uh, let's go to Daniel... And we'll read in Daniel, verses uh, 4, starting in verse 4, in chapter 12. But you, Daniel, shut up these words and seal them, the book, until the time of the end. Here he's saying the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And look at all the knowledge, the technology. Now we have the internet. There's so much knowledge and information. It can just be an overload. It can be overwhelming. But we need to learn to prioritize what information, what knowledge we want to learn with, what we want to grow with. So continuing in verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one with the river bank and the other on that river bank. And he says, you know, how about they're, they're clothed in linen, and he continues here, about a continuing here, he says in verse 8, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what is this that shall be in the end, and what will these things be? 
and they said, "Go." And then the, he was told, Daniel, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked will do wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But the wise shall understand. And from that time that the daily sacrifices is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So that's over three years, about three and a half years. And here's an abomination. The daily sacrifices were stopped as they were supposed to continue. And we know that it did happen with Antiochus Epiphany in about 167 BCE, and also in 70 AD. How, now, was this fulfilled in 70 AD? Many people wonder, okay, well, maybe it was fulfilled. The daily sacrifices, the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, well, we'll get to that, because here Daniel says the time of the end, and, and are we at the end yet? And some people say, well, that was the end of the, the covenant the, that was made at Mount Sinai, but is it really the time of the end? Let's continue to see what the, the writers of the scriptures will, will reveal to us through Shaul, Paul, and John, or his Hebrew name is Yochanan. And he says here, Blessed and holy is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the time of the end. You shall rest. And he's speaking to Daniel here, going to, uh, he, will, he will rest in terms of being symbolic of, of sleep and, and death. And will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So here, Daniel says he'll be resurrected from the dead. A promise. Da Daniel knew that there was a resurrection from the dead. And so did the Hebrews. There was a big argument in the first century between the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees knew there was a resurrection from the dead to come at the end of the age. And that has not come yet, as we'll see as we continue with some of these scriptures here. Um, the, for example, the Apostle Paul, or Shaul, as we say in Hebrew, in 2 Thessalonians, if you'll turn to 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 2, <clears throat> here uh, he says, starting in verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that day, will not come unless a falling away comes first. And that Greek word for falling away is apostasia a falling away of truth, a defection from truth. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, this man has not been revealed to me yet. I don't know who he is. I don't think he's been revealed on the world scene yet. Um, so a lot of, some people claim they know who he is, but a lot of people have been wrong. And so... What is this man? What are his characteristics? What are the fruits are we to look for? Okay, well, he says here, who oppresses and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Antiochus Epiphany. As I mentioned before in Greek, means God manifested. This man of sin is going to be very similar to that. He's going to claim to be God manifested. And he's going to deceive people. Now how do we know the difference between him and the Messiah that's coming back? And we, many of us see him as divine. And is, how do we know the difference between the two? Well, he says here in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I, I told you of these things. So the Apostle Shaul was taught these things in more detail. We don't have that in writing, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately but we have the Ruach, which, which can teach us, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And now you know what is restraining, that he 
may be revealed in his own time. So when the time is right, he'll be revealed for the mystery, the mystery, the hidden truth uh, of lawlessness is already at work. So this guy is, he's against Torah, lawlessness, against the instructions of, of the, the Holy Scriptures. He's going to be against the Torah. And he his, his says that it is already at work. Meaning this false religious system is, is already being taught in the first century. That the law was done away with. That it was nailed to the cross. Of course, our Messiah came to die for our sins. And the penalties, uh, the death penalty. And that, you know, we can no longer have to have the sacrificial system for forgiveness of sins and, and cleansing and, and so forth. That he is our eternal sacrifice. But they will twist this and, and teach against the laws, that you don't have to keep them, that certain ones were done away with and nailed that, that are still alive today, especially those Ten Commandments that he wrote with his own finger. We shouldn't be trying to do away with things that have not been done away with, things that have not been nullified. We have to be real careful. We know what we're doing when we say things like that. So this mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. He, he now is restrains, only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So he's going to be allowed to do these things, this man of sin, and eventually the Creator is going to step in, the Messiah is going to step in and take care of things with his return, but he, this man of sin is going to get away with some pretty bad things in the meantime, just like Antiochus Epiphany was allowed to get away with some horrible things, if we read the book of Maccabees. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of what we say, Hasatan, in Hebrew, a Satan or the devil, with all power, with signs and lying wonders. He's going to be a master liar, a deceiver, very charismatic, very good with people, and uh, probably a great sense of humor too. He will be able to persuade and use miracles to persuade as well. Very, very charismatic. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who per are perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So you have to receive the love of the truth. You've got to love the truth. You've got to love it. And how do you know it? By reading this. By, by knowing it. He says, and for this reason, God will send a strong delusion. So our Creator will send a delusion. He's actually blessing these evil forces to test us, as it says here, that they should believe the lie. Those who don't love the truth are going to believe it. And that they, that they all may be consumed who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we have to be careful. We're not taking pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this man of sin, this book of, of Thessalonians was written before 70 AD. So here some believers say, well, and scholars, Christians, Protestants will say, hey, well that was, done, that was already fulfilled in 70 AD and the temple was destroyed. Well, how about John, the book of Revelation, which he wrote about 90 AD. He was in his 90s, so this is like about 20 years or more after 70 AD. The temple was destroyed for over two, two decades, and we can turn to Revelation uh, chapter 13, verses 13 through 18. Please put pause if you don't have your Bible with you. Open it up. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 through 18. And I'm going to read here where it says, um, talking about this 
all back up to verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. So he's going to try to look like the Messiah. And he spoke like a dragon. Of course, so his speaking, his teaching is going to be backed up by the, the dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship him, the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So he's going to have a deadly wound that will miraculously be healed. And he performs great signs. Here's the same, sounds like the same person Paul was speaking about in Thessalonians. Great signs, so that even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And we can turn back to the scriptures. We see Elijah doing that. We see King David doing it. And even Solomon did it. We can find it in the scriptures. So, it's going to seem like a prophet. But we need to see it's a counterfeit. You know, he's speaking lawlessness. He's speaking against the Torah. And uh, here in verse 14, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who who dwell on the earth to make an image, notice this, make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and, and lived. So there's an image. That's what Antiochus Epiphany did. Way back in the time of the Maccabees, he built up a statue and put it right there. Similar to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he did that in Daniel's time. And, and uh, Daniel's three friends there wouldn't bow to it. And they were thrown into the fire. And most of us know that story. Uh, it's, it's a great story, and so we think these stories were just a long time ago, but they are going to come back. And that's the purpose of this teaching here, is they're coming back. And, and, and so we need to be careful. This isn't just old stuff that, that's something that can inspire us and keep us fired up spiritually, but it's also a forte of something more intense, a more horrible that's going to come in the future. And we're going to read about that next. But first, continuing here in Revelation, and he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Here's this statue, this image that's set up in, in the holy temple there in Jerusalem that would speak and cause many to worship the image of the beast. And if you don't, you'll be killed. Okay? That's what it says here. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their, ha on their right hand and on their forehead, so that no one may buy or sell except those who receive the mark or the name of the beast and, or the number of the name. You know, and it says that here is the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Here it says a man. His number is 666. And in, in, in Roman numerals and even in ancient Hebrew uh, letters, you've, we find numbers. So somehow the letters of his name are going to, you know, and some people think it's going to be more of the Greek or Roman, uh, and many of us believe it'll be the Hebrew. It might be both. Our, you know, this it could be a way to be a witness to everybody, but somehow his name, the, the letters, the are going to be numbers that add up to 666. And this is going to be a horrible time. Our Messiah says this is going to be the horriblest time in all human history, which is worse than what happened in the time of the Maccabees, worse than what happened in the 20th century with the Nazis and the, and the, the German Holocaust that happened and this is going to be the worst time in human history. It's, it's talked about in uh, our Messiah in, in Matthew chapter 24. If we turn to Matthew chapter 24, very quickly here. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, we just read about that, and spoken of in Daniel, and, and standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then those who are in Judea will flee into the mountains. And we continue down in verse 20. And pray that your flight be not in the winter or on a Shabbat or on a Sabbath day. Sabbath days are still important at this end time. For then there will be a great tribulation such as not happened since the beginning of the